Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Home Daily for Wednesday, June 19th, 2019. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the latest film and TV news. This is Slash Home Editor-in-Chief Peter Serretta, and joining me on today's podcast is Slash Home Managing Editor Jacob Paul. Hello, hello. And Senior Editor Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? A, a couple days ago, we talked about, I think I, I brought up the question of, has there ever been a good movie prequel? And we got a couple of responses that I don't think any of these are actually valid, but I, I'll bring them up on the air just just because people emailed them to me. Uh, John A. <laughs> says Batman Begins is a good movie prequel. I, I feel like that's a reboot. That's not a prequel, right? Uh, yeah, I think you're right, Peter. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's a brand new movie. Uh, I mean, it's not like it's saying Safe Place before, you know, Michael Keaton as Batman. So it uh, doesn't count, although I, I, I appreciate what – john is going for here but i don't think it quite qualifies yeah um stephen b wrote in that temple of doom would be a good movie prequel and i call it bs on that because i feel like that is just a prequel by the circumstances it's not really like a traditional prequel it's yes it's set before raiders of the lost ark but i feel like i didn't even know that until i bought the set on you know i think dvd or vhs and they one of the sets had like the the dates on like each of the like when they were supposed to take place and i was like oh it's a prequel it, it didn't even occur to me jacob is this a prequel it, no, here's the thing technically yes it is set before the events of raiders but the point of a prequel is to is to greatly inform you know a previous work to to explain you know a circumstance that led to that and this actually contradicts Raiders, because in Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones doesn't believe in the superstitious hokum. And here he is watching hearts get torn out two years prior or or whatever. So it doesn't make any sense as a prequel. I think it's just Lucas and Spielberg having some fun with dates. Because if, if you actually try to take it literally yeah. as an origin story for Indy or something that, that, that informs Raiders, they contradict each other in a pretty wild way. Yeah, I would. Uh, you weren't on that podcast, Jacob. Is there any good movie prequels? Oh goodness! Um, so, sorry to put you on is, the spot. Yeah, but... uh, I think Better Call Saul is a brilliant prequel, but it's TV, so I can't really uh, go. Be... Off the top of my head, no. Off the top of my head, I'm not thinking of any prequels that I love. I'm looking uh, at a list right now, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Fast Five is technically a prequel to the Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift. <laughs> so that's, that's you know, got to throw that in there. And also, same thing with Wonder Woman, which is technically a prequel to Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. Yeah, well, Fast Five, that's kind of like a Temple of Doom scenario, right? Like, that's not informing anything. That's just because of one of the characters... That that's just because it, logistically it has to be there, right? Right, right. Yes, oh, I just you oh, know technicalities, but okay. I, I have one. Uh, I know it's not the most beloved Pixar movie, but I have a real soft spot for oh. Monster, Monsters University. Yeah, uh, you're and right. I, and I think oh. that one actually is a really strong movie with a really strong message at the end that really informs where Mike and Skelly come from and Monsters Inc. is them being non-college educated spoiler alert for that movie that came out eight years ago or whatever where the movie ends with them having a successful filling happy lives despite not finishing college and that kind of informs why they're so bound together and where their friendship comes from is because they both went through this experience together and it really informs why they're best friends and actually improves mantras inc uh on second watch so i would argue for mantras university see jacob i knew you'd have the answer you have the answer for everything okay let's uh jump into the news Let's start off first with Spider-Man Far From Home. Ben, you saw it, and now you're allowed to post your your early buzz on social media. So what did you think? Um, guys, this movie is very strange. I'll say that. Uh, I think ultimately, just to put this out, out there, I think I would give it like a, like a B minus, um, you know, quality wise. I'm not sure exactly where that falls on my personal ranking of MCU movies. But uh, for everybody who loved the um, teen romance kind of angle of and, and like the awkward high school part of Spider-Man Homecoming, that kind of stuff is still very much present in this movie. Uh, you know, obviously a continuation, a sort of evolution of that. So Tom Holland is still, you know, super charming as young Peter Parker. And uh, Zendaya has a much bigger role this time around than she did last time where she was just sort of like peppered in a little bit. Um 
so that stuff is is really great. But there is some there is some stuff that happens in this movie that I was not expecting, and um, it, it's almost like there's two movies here. There's like the you know the the teen stuff, which is great, and then the larger mythos stuff, which is um, is surprising in ways that you're not expecting. And I'll just maybe leave it at that because it's it's very difficult to talk about this movie yeah. uh, in broad strokes. But there's a lot of really fun stuff here. There's some stuff that doesn't quite work for me, but um, overall, I still think I enjoyed it. It, it. I will say it leaves you with a lot to think about when you walk out of the theater. So you know, Ben, you and I were talking about this um, in private to help to start planning coverage. And I'm a much easier sell on the MCU than you are, I think. I'm, I'm a shell for it sometimes. Mm-hmm. And the stuff you were skeptical about on paper made me very excited. <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave that there. Yeah. I, I will say I will agree, though, that stuff does very subvert your expectations. I, and I think people are starting to value that more for good or bad. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to see. I, I, I'm excited to see this. But I'm interested to see what people's reaction is to this movie. Um, okay, let's uh, let's move on. Let's talk about some actual news. Let's talk about Alamo Drafthouse, which, um, fingers crossed, is actually going to open in Los Angeles after, I think, like six years of claiming they were going to open in Los Angeles. Ben, what do we know? Yeah, so they originally said that they were supposed to open in L.A. back in 2015, and then that opening was pu- was pushed back to 2018, and they finally settled on 2019 as the new target opening date. And today, uh, the Alamo Drafthouse, which is a, a theater that originated in Austin, Texas, it's uh, Jacob's home theater. Uh, very, you know, I mean, everybody who's listening is probably familiar with it. It's you know, the no talking, no texting theater. They actually care a lot about presentation. They serve food, the whole thing. They've got a bar. It's like you know, one of the coolest movie theaters in the world um la which is a, a very big movie town as as you know it's probably obvious uh does not have one yet but now finally we are going to be getting our own draft house and this is finally confirmed because the draft house themselves sent out a press release saying that a soft launch is happening in early july so that's like two weeks from now um so this is going to be opening in downtown la at a an area called the block which is like an open air property right in the at the heart of downtown and it, it's sort of at the crossroads of a lot of the um, public transportation, uh, like metro rails and stuff like that. So it should be really easy for a lot of people to get to. Um, They're going to have their own, uh, what is it called? The Video Vortex, which is like the place where you can rent Blu-rays and DVDs for free. Um, And they're going to have their own bar. And it's a 12-screen theater with 4K projectors and one 35-millimeter projector. Um, They're going to have, you know, all sorts of different screenings from, you know, brand new blockbusters to indie stuff to repertory stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's it's really exciting for people who who live in L.A. and who have been looking forward to this for a long time. Well, Ben... You and I both live in Los Angeles, and we, we – actually, have you ever been to the Alamo Draft House? I have in Kansas City. When I visited Kansas City uh, a couple times, I've, I've been, yes. Yeah. I, I have also been in Austin, Texas. I love it. But downtown, are you actually going to make the trek downtown? That's the thing. I I will not make this my regular movie theater because the ArcLight in Hollywood, which is also another really great theater, is so much closer to me. It's it's actually close enough where I can walk there from my apartment. So I th- it's going to be tough to get me to you know to to go out of my way to see a movie there. But the good thing about the Draft House is I think they're going to be planning a lot of really cool events and screenings and stuff like that there that you won't be able to see at other places and maybe they'll be able to get some you know good talent and q a's with filmmakers and all that kind of stuff so you know depending on the uh, the <laughs> my love for whatever property they happen to be representing or <laughs> or something like that you know i feel like it'll be really easy to um to drag me downtown because it's, it's pretty easy to just jump on the the metro rail or whatever and and oh yeah and you're you know, really close to that i'm a little bit further away yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I, I think it'll be something that I go to, you know, uh, several times a year, a handful of times a year, but um, maybe not my primary theater. Jacob, I'm curious. I know you love the Alamo Draft House. They, they they used to at least at least they used to. I'm not sure if they still do. But they used to have like these weekly events, like uh, Weird Wednesdays and stuff like that. Is that something they do at all Alamo Draft Houses, or is that just because Austin is so cool? 
uh, I know that Austin still does have Terror Tuesdays and Weird Wednesdays, being uh, Terror Tuesday where they screen an obscure or famous, based on whoever's programming, uh, horror movie. And Weird Wednesday where they show exploitation and weird fringe stuff. And they still do it, and they recently uh, did move it to a larger theater as opposed to the one where they used to show it. So it still happens. I think it depends on the movie, depends on the screening. I'm not so sure where it reaches outside of Austin, but I do know that uh, I, I do know that um, each theater tends to have its own stable of programmers working on their own unique regional things. And with the LA film scene already being so crowded. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the full plans are for the LA Draft House. We should maybe get them on the line. Uh, that would be a great. That would be a great interview or even podcast guest to get somebody on here. Uh, but they're going to need to pull all stops to get people excited about another theater. And so I think LA people should keep a, a real close eye on their schedule because if they try to even mimic what Austin does in terms of cool, fringe, unique, crazy screenings, there's going to be some. There's going to be reasons to go downtown. Yeah, and I, that, that's what excites me about this is because. The Austin Draft House does so many cool things, but the LA, you know, being in LA means that you have access to so much talent, some actors, filmmakers, you know I mean? producers, special effects people. I feel like there's such an opportunity here to do some, some great stuff. So I'm excited to see what they pull out of their hat. But, uh, okay, let's talk about, um, Paranormal Activity. Apparently, another sequel is in development. Jacob, why? Uh, why is because these movies are about 50% good and it's time for another one uh, the movie comes out of uh, Cine Europe which is the European version of CinemaCon and Paramount Pictures chairman and CEO Jim Giannopoulos said the following uh, during a presentation we are partnering with uber horror producer Jason Blum to bring a new installment of Paranormal Activity and of course Jason Blum is now super famous as the producer of Get Out, Us, Halloween Happy Death Day, The Purge Sinister, Split, just Nobody has done more in the past decade um, to shape what modern horror movies are than Jason Blum. And it all started with Paranormal Activity in 2009, which we forget uh, now, now that it's six movies deep, was a genuine bona fide cultural event. I mean, people yeah. talked about that movie. It was a huge deal. It's a film festivals first, and then By the way, I, I saw that film at the Telluride Film Festival in the first screening of it, first and only screening of it at that film festival – was outside at a like they they screened some stuff outside just on their main street like there's like a little like they build like a little uh screen and stuff like that so i i watched that outside with a bunch of people you know just like uh on the ground sitting on the ground <laughs> yeah it was it was it was it was it was yeah yeah it was mind blowing because i mean i know we've had um found footage stuff before but this kind of pushed things uh in a different area i'm actually kind of wondering how has our world changed to make per, uh, like another paranormal activity movie any different or better? I guess now, like so many of like my neighbors have like those ring um, doorbell cameras. Yeah. So I know I, I now you can cut to that. I guess. Yeah, and I'm really curious because uh, each entry in the series did try to play with the new ways of of displaying the found footage because the first one famously was made for $150,000 and made $200 million worldwide, which is why Jason Blum's a super producer now, because he pulled that off. But uh, and the movie was, you know, very much filmed by characters, you know, ho holding camcorders, setting up television cameras in their bedroom, trying to capture paranormal activity. And the second one uh, uh, set up, you know, the whole gimmick was more cameras, you know, lots of a whole full-fledged security system around a house. A third one was set in the 80s, so it was a prequel, and it had all kinds of camcorder tech including a scene where camcorder is loaded onto a uh, revolving fan to get a, like a full v 180 view of a room <laughs> the fourth one had xbox connect uh used in night vision to, to detect ghostly shapes so they and even part six had somebody build an occult camera uh designed to be able to see ghosts like invisible ghosts on, on camera so they, they keep they to the series is credit uh, through its ups and downs, it did push forward. It did say, what is new in technology? What can we invent? What can we create? What can we borrow to find new ways to have ghosts jump out of people in their houses? And I'll say as much, Peter, the odd-numbered paranormal activities, the first, third, and the fifth ones, are the good ones. So if they do make a seventh one, it, it's the law that it has to be good. So, uh, so this is uh, kind of like the Star Trek yeah. rule. Yeah. It, uh, two, four, and six are bad movies. One, three, and five are good. 
So seven has to be good. It's just how things work. It's the law. It's the rules. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll have to see what that actually is uh, when they formally announce it. Uh, but let's uh, talking about announcements, Disney did announce today a new Pixar film, an original Pixar film coming from Pete Docter. Ben, what do we know about this? Yeah, this movie is called Soul, and it hits theaters one year from today. So June 19th, 2020. Uh, Pete Docter, who directed Up and Monsters, Inc. and Inside Out, is directing this, and uh, it's being produced by Dana Murray, who produced the 2017 short film Lou. And the uh, official synopsis reads as such. Ever wonder where your passion, your dreams, and your interests come from? What is it, what it is that makes you, you? In 2020, Pixar Animation Studios takes you on a journey from the streets of New York City to the cosmic realms to discover the answers to life's most important questions. So that's all we know. It's it's pretty vague, but uh, as Jacob mentioned in our Slack channel when this news dropped, it kind of sounds a little bit like a spiritual sequel to Inside Out, which is Pete Docter's most recent Pixar movie, and uh, it sort of seems like it's going to continue the studio's like existential exploration of the human condition. So, um, it, you know, as vague as that is, I, I really like the stuff that Pete Docter makes. He's actually the chief creative officer at Pixar right now who, you know, he replaced John Lasseter. So, um, you know, he, he's very much, uh, beloved within Pixar itself. He's been there since the beginning. He worked on the story of the first toy story movie. So, um, and what, yeah, what movies I mean, have he made? He made uh, monster sync and then yeah, up. monster sync, uh, up and inside out are his three. Yeah. So he's three, three, three masterpieces, three. <laughs> like three of the absolute best Pixar movies. <laughs> I feel like I would retire at that point. I'd just be like, okay, guys, drop the mic. I'm done. <laughs> uh, remember when Shre- Shrek beat Montezuma at the Oscars for the first Best Animated Film Oscar? Remember when that tr- atrocity happened? <laughs> yeah. I try to forget about that. Okay. Uh, speaking of Disney, they did make an announcement that Avengers Endgame is going to be returning to theater uh, uh, theaters uh, nationwide. Jacob, what do we know? Uh, what we know is that Avengers Endgame is within spitting distance of crossing Avatar at the worldwide box office. And even though Disney owns Avatar now, they're not going to let another studio's product uh, overwhelm Avengers Endgame. So they're giving this one last push. Uh, interestingly, uh, Endgame will not pass the domestic uh, uh, all-time. That's, that belongs to Star Wars The Force Awakens, but... It could potentially pass Avatar if it has one last push, which is what they're going for. Kevin Feige, speaking of Screen Rant, uh, revealed that there will be a new version of the film being released in the theaters with a new marketing push. Uh, here's what he had to say about it. It's not an extended cut, but there will be a version going into theaters with a bit of marketing push and a few new things at the end of the movie. If you stay and watch the movie, after the credits, there will be a deleted scene, a little tribute, and a few surprises, uh, which will be next weekend. So he doesn't go beyond what, what this means. Uh, Chris Vangelista, who wrote this article on Slash Film, uh, guesses that the tribute could be a Stan Lee tribute that's uh, been previously teased for, as a potential DVD special feature. Uh, the lead scene, we have no idea. A few surprises, who knows? My guess is that th- is that if you're hoping for something big or major, it's probably not worth getting too excited about. But as an excuse to go see it one more time, why the hell not? And clearly Disney wants that record and they're going to make one last push for it. Uh, Peter and Ben, is this stuff get you back in theater? I don't, I don't think so. Cause I've already seen the movie twice. Um, and I, I think you're right. I think it's going to be like a blooper reel and yeah, maybe a small Stan Lee thing or something that will uh, probably ultimately be accessible on Disney plus or, you know, at, at some other place. If this was like, I don't know, uh, Peter, what do you think? What I think, Ben, is that I had an $850 million side bet on the summer movie wager, and this is going to put me in in the winning spot for that, so I'm happy. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, because this is some, some asterisk <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, it was released during the summer. Those, those, those monies count towards the box office total, so I, I will have won this thing, so, or at least the side bet. Probably not the whole thing because of Pokemon and I might me overestimating millennials. But oh, Peter, <laughs> uh, Pokemon and Secret Life of Pets two underperforming has sunk me. So you know yeah. we're, we're, we're both together. <laughs> okay, uh, speaking of Marvel, we've uh, been talking about Comic Con and how you know Warner Brothers not coming to the convention has kind of put a damper on things. We were actually speculating what if Marvel doesn't decide to go to San Diego. Uh, now we have a confirmation. Jacob, what do we uh, know? 
it's not quite a confirmation as much as it is a very solid report uh, spec uh, announcing what we more or less could have assumed that uh, Deadline is reporting that Marvel will return to Call H for Comic Con this year. Uh, Marvel themselves has still remained quiet, uh, but Deadline is a major trade, and although I have issues with them, uh, they tend to get this stuff right. So what they write is that uh, they'll return to tease all the post Endgame slate of movies and maybe even busy plus shows. So that could mean news about Doctor Strange 2, Black Panther 2, Black Widow, Eternals. In fact, with uh, Black Widow having begun production, maybe they'll even have a few seconds of footage. They could have the Eternals cast, you know, Richard Madden, Angelina Jolie, Camille Nanjiani up on stage. I would not be surprised if we get like a Doctor Strange 2 title, a Black, uh, Black Panther 2 title. Um, I feel like this is like, in, in a year where Lost News is sitting this out, Marvel could walk out spend two hours announcing titles, bringing out cast members, and dominate. I feel like this could be, like, them setting the stage for the next ten years, like they have in the past. Uh, Peter, what do you think? Well, the last time we had any situation like this was at the El Capitan event in Hollywood. Uh, Like, we... I mean, literally, they have not really announced anything uh, concrete beyond beyond uh, Black Widow and Eternals, right? So, they could set the stage for the entire phase four or, or, you know, the future of the MCU. Uh, I'm excited because this means that there'll at least be one good panel at the, at this year's uh, San Diego comic-con. Um, but I'm just wondering, you make a good point here, uh, Jacob, like they're what they're currently filming black widow, but they're not going to be filming Eternals or anything else. I, I guess they could show some of the Disney plus stuff, but like there's, they don't have much to show in terms of footage. Yeah, I don't think we'll see any footage uh, from most things. Like I said, maybe something from Black Widow. But I remember I was not there, but I was you know reading the internet and writing on the internet when uh, they announced Guardians of the Galaxy and they released that very early piece of concept art. And everyone said, what the hell is this? And that piece of concept art became um, website headers for about three years before we saw an official still from that movie. So I would not be surprised if we saw like a piece of Eternals art, you know, a piece of Black Widow art, Doctor Strange two art. We saw something that said, "Hey, here's a brisk tease of new characters, new worlds," and them getting us excited, them showing off a bunch of titles, a bunch of logos. I think that's what we'll get: uh, less footage, more of like a deluge of like announcements of like the next six movies or so. But that that would be my guess. I'd put about eight dollars on it. You know what I also <laughs> think we'll get? We'll get James Gunn on stage because I feel like that would be an epic return. After what happened last year to him, yeah, um, I hope so. Yeah, but uh, okay, let's move on to a rumor, and this is a rumor involving theme parks. Uh, both Jacob and I love, uh, you know, the Disney theme parks and Universal theme parks. Uh, the rumor is that the Country Bear Jamboree might be going the way of it might might be gone. Ben, what do we know? Yeah, so the Country Bear Jamboree is a, uh, it's essentially like a, a, an animatronic stage show. Um, it actually opened, it's it was, it's been there since Walt Disney World opened in 1971. So this, this thing has been around for a long time, but a new rumor says that it might not actually stay alive long enough to see the park's upcoming 50th anniversary in 2021. So um, Walt Disney World News Today, I think is what the uh, WD... WNT stands for is uh, is re- they initially reported that this um, attraction will be going away and that section of the rumor was actually backed up by another um, outlet called Disney and more uh, but Walt Disney World News today also reports something that Disney and more could not confirm which is that uh, this Country Bear Jamboree is actually going to be replaced by a Toy Story marionette show that will be inspired by the 1950s era Woody's Roundup. TV show that we see in Toy Story 2. So if this is true, this is going to be adding another Toy Story attraction to Walt Disney World. This is interesting because this is the, the location would make this Toy Story attraction notably be outside of Toy Story Land at Disney's Hollywood Studios, which just opened last year. So there's like a lot of Toy Story stuff going on here. But uh, and obviously like Disney purists are not happy with the idea of ditching this um, day one, you know, opening doors uh, classic to many attraction because, um, you know, Disney purists, Disney hardcore fans love the uh, the pageantry and the 
um, you know, there's a lot of history and traditions and, and um, do, do you have any experience with this attraction? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I've been to Walt Disney World a bunch of times and I must have been in there and seen it, you know, when I was a kid, but I don't, it never made any uh, lasting impact on me and I, I actually don't really remember it, but I, I embedded a video of the entire thing in this article if people want to watch it and sort of refresh their memories yeah. if you are, are like me. But uh, you, you guys are like the big, as you mentioned, the big theme park fans. So I'm, I'm wondering what you guys feel here because I'm just sort of like uh, ambivalent about this, but I wonder if either of you have like passionate feelings about this, especially Jake, because I think Walt Disney World was like your theme park of choice for a long time. Yeah, I, I actually have two very strong feelings about this uh one is that this is a piece of disney history it is a a, um show designed from the ground up by mark davis who is a disney legend he designed show scenes for the haunted mansion and for parts of the caribbean and walt disney like even though personally approved the show before he passed away uh this is like very much a piece of like legendary disney history it is very much a piece of one of the most important guys in theme park history, Mark Davis, uh, his untouched, for the most part, work, you know, on full display for historical purposes. With that said, this show does not have lines, never fills the theater. I don't personally enjoy it very much. I don't find it particularly funny, even though people have a strong attachment to it. I do not blame Disney for wanting to replace it with an IP that, that you know, people genuinely love. But I feel like I feel like they're losing something big here. I feel like they could easily build a Toy Story attraction in Magic Kingdom's Frontierland, which is where this is, on the much empty space they have around that area, and leave this one up for historical purposes and just to fulfill the nostalgia of people coming for the 50th anniversary. I feel like this is a mistake of main levels, and also it gets thematically muddled because, yes, there's now Toy Story Land at Hollywood Studios, but there's also Buzz Lightyear's Space Ranger spin at Magic Kingdom, which is an like a older Toy Story ride. So my whole thing is like, there's just too much Toy Story outside of Toy Story Land now, and that bothers me as a theme park fan. So, But Devil's Advocate, Frontierland is the perfect place for Woody's roundup. Then build it next to Country Bears. <laughs> don't build yeah. it over Country Bears. It, I feel so strange because I don't, even, I don't even like Country Bears, but <laughs> I, lo- I think Mark Davis is one, of the most, is one of the unsung titans of American pop culture, and they're getting ready to get rid of it. And... I just feel like I know like a half dozen people listening to this podcast care about this, but I am deeply concerned about people not knowing the name Mark Davis in you know a half century when he is as responsible for Disney theme parks along with Claude Coates and other Imagineers as Walt Disney was. Well, first of all, Jacob, I used to uh, you know vacation at Walt Disney World as a kid, and I remember my dad videotaping this show. I don't quite remember experiencing the show as a kid, but I remember video watching this videotape over and over again and being in just awe of like all these characters. Uh, there's that one point there's like uh, a character like swinging above the audience. It's very much like almost like a uh, tiki room kind of experience. And I, I growing up in the eighties, I feel like anybody growing up in the eighties, loved these kind of animatronic creatures like we grew up with like you know teddy ruxpin and going to Chuck E. cheese and uh you know we have a fondness for these animatronics and uh we lost country bear jamboree in disneyland uh i think probably like a decade ago or something uh replaced by winnie the pooh and i uh hate that i i feel like if if they are gonna i mean i get it Okay, I get it. The kids don't even know who the Country Bears are. They're singing like these Western style songs that probably are not appealing to, you know, uh, general audiences. Um, you know, there's probably not packing that theater. So the, the, Disney's like looking, how can we maximize, you know, guest satisfaction? Uh, let's put an IP in there. And, you know, that makes sense. I'm not disappointed by that. But what I would say is save the country bears, right? Like, let's move the country bears to somewhere. Like, move them to uh, – maybe move them to Disneyland where they could be in – um, uh, what, what's that place called? The Saloon. I forget the name of it. Or move it to um, – there, there's a resort in Walt Disney World, uh, the Wilderness Lodge? Yeah, the Wilderness Lodge, yeah. They have like a a show, a stage show there. Maybe move it there. Like move it somewhere. Preserve preserve this history for generations to you know 
discover and experience, but uh, I'm not against. Actually, actually, Peter, that 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 reminds me, or that I mean, that inspires a question that I have for you guys. And as somebody who's not a huge theme park, um, you know, doesn't follow the news and really doesn't understand how a lot of the ins and outs work, maybe you guys can answer this question: Is there a way for them to? Um, I mean, because Walt Disney World has so much space, like Jacob mentioned, maybe they could build an entire section of the park and take all of the, I don't know, old classics and and move them there as sort of like a museum within Walt Disney World that that would, you mm. know, preserve the attractions and and be like a place where purists could go and know that the stuff is is not in any danger of being removed ever, and and then they could replace the those attractions with you know new ip and stuff like that um at the locations where the old ones are right now do you know what i'm saying like is that is that even feasible or is that something that that you could see them doing or no a disney theme park museum i mean i would love that personally but uh like honestly if you look at the other theme parks if you look at like universal studios in orlando florida I think they only have one or two attractions that were there on day one of opening. Everything else has been replaced. Um, but if you look at something like Disneyland or even Disney World, it's much harder in that fan base to replace the Walt Disney classics. Like, you know, they, we still have Autopia in Tomorrowland and Disneyland, and it's it takes up so much space. Like, you could fit, you know... You could fit probably Star Wars land in that amount of space, and they're not replacing it because, you know, this is a original created by Walt Disney. So I'm, I'm wondering what you think, Jacob. Like, when does it become a point where, like, people are not, you know, excited for these rides and history? Like, what do you do with history? This is such a good question because Universal breaks my heart as much as I love it because there's no nostalgic Universal. The Universal creative team says – if it's not packing houses, if people aren't familiar with the name, we replace it, we upgrade, we say high tech, we say cutting edge, we move on. Whereas Disney does not have those feelings, which means that they're always taking five to ten years to get one ride built because they're always being so careful. Whereas Universal is saying, screw it, we got to get stuff done, which leads to two very different mindsets. And I struggle with both because I think Disney needs to get with the program. I think Universal needs to care more about its history. I think there, there is a happy medium. And... When I was at Disney World uh, the other week for Toy Story 4 Press, you know, you can see where they're building the new Tron coaster, and it's right next to Space Mountain, sort of behind it. And it's in a space where if you previously were in the park, previously riding other rides, you did not notice that space. It was space that was set aside for future expansion. But the genius of Disney theme park layout is that you do not notice the expansion pads. If they feel invisible, the land feels full until suddenly, oh, there's space I did not know was there. Uh, we, let's go ahead and uh, expand it. And I feel like as unlikely as the idea of a of a land dedicated Disney history would be, I mean, like that's also where Hall of Presidents could go, since that thing right. is always on the bubble. Yeah, I, I just feel like it's a great idea, but you know, there is a massive, massive of the tens of millions of people. But, who goes what what about Disney not World. even a, a land? What about a like actual a museum i know they have the walt disney museum in san francisco which is dedicated to the man himself but like what about a museum dedicated to the theme parks where you could actually you know rescue some of these things that would never be seen outside of like you know maybe a d23 convention or something like that goodness a a massive building on disney property probably a separate admission that was like a country bear jamboree uh the carousel of progress which another show that nobody um goes to that people are, are are still attached to concept art models all the stuff that's just hanging out in disney archives all of presidents Be, yeah all presidents just given a new home on disney property and a massive space for real theme park nuts to pay you know the 25 dollars admission to go spend an afternoon exploring it looking at the art looking over notes looking over notebooks you know watching little documentaries about the making of i don't think disney would ever spend money on this because <laughs> they, they are because the, the theme park nuts like you and me peter we're the niche we're like the five percent of the people who go to disney world every year but i think that would be a generally incredible cultural uh moment it would be something that would truly say hey theme park design is an art form and we disney are going to acknowledge that by investing in it but the question is would they ever do that i think the answer is no yeah uh, sadly i think you're right 
But uh, we have gone over our time limit for today. So this is the end of today's Slash Film Daily. Uh, you can find more of all of our work at SlashFilm.com. You can find links to all the articles we talked about on today's podcast in the show notes. This podcast, Slash Film Daily, is published every weekday on iTunes, Google, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to us at Peter at SlashFilm.com. And please rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends. Spread the word. And we'll see you tomorrow. A potential theme park or whatever like mini land of all of that stuff would infuriate you as somebody who appreciates like design and layout <laughs> to have like jungle cruise right next to haunted mansion right next to you know oh. some of these things like i just feel like that you would lose your mind <laughs> then i'm dreading when they try to add a rock animatronic figure to um jungle cruise it's like oh look there's so and so and he's oh, in no. the jungle now i, I forgot dreading. about that <laughs> it's oh, it's God. going to happen yeah, <laughs> but w- w- one of the questions I do pose, like whenever I go to Disneyland with new people, I, I ask them, like, what attractions here do you think like are a hundred percent safe? Well, they'll never replace. And like, I feel like the the ones that most people say are pirates, haunted mansion, and a small world. So I'm wondering what you think, Jacob. Like, what what which ones? If you had to pick five attractions that like will never be destroyed, never be replaced, only uh, be updated. Let's... I'll, uh, let's see, Haunted Mansion, Pirates, uh, Big Thunder, Big, sorry, Big Thunder Mountain. Uh, sp- um, Big Thunder Mountain's Mountain. like a newer one, so what was yeah. that, 80s, 70s? Uh, yeah, early 80s. Uh, Splash Mountain and Space Mountain, I think those five are forever safe. They're, they're, they're too iconic, they're too important, too much of a touchstone for people. Yeah. It's crazy. Also, because, because Space Mountain is a, is, a, is a 40-year-old roller coaster, and it still had three-hour lines while I was there. So it's like, so it's not like Country Bear Jamboree where nobody's there. Like, you go yeah. into that show, and there's like five people in the, in the theater. But Space Mountain packs them in. So, But it's also a much different thing in Orlando as it is in, in Anaheim, because Orlando, there's still space. They, they have a, a ton of land there. They can expand, you know, they can create as many parks as they want. Um, it's just a matter of, like, how, how long can someone plan a vacation for? Um, in Anaheim, the space is very limited. So I feel like eventually one of these days, you know, think something like it's a small world is going to come up on the chopping block. It has to, right? I would suck because the uh, it's a small world in Disneyland uh, is so much better than one in Disney World. The one in Disney World kind of kind of blows, whereas the one in uh, <laughs> yeah. Disneyland is is the small world. Uh, it is has a better entrance. It has a better layout. It doesn't get bogged down as much. We try to exit the boat. It is just a has a better queue. It is just the better version. And I think you're right. I think that if one version is going to get chopped, it's going to be that one. Yeah. And they'll, they'll take Haunted Mansion from my frail dead hands. Oh, I, I will <laughs> lay down in front of the fucking bulldozers, Peter. I will, like, chain myself to the front gate. not take a Haunted Mansion. <laughs> you and me both. We'll, 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 yeah, chain ourselves to the front gates. <laughs> they'll just, like, lift the front gates with a crane and then <laughs> move us out of there. That's when the bomb goes off in my shoes to destroy the bulldozer. I, I will... Suicide bomb myself on those bulldozers to save the haunted mansion, Peter. Wow, wow. A, Disney, a Disneyland uh, radicalist. Uh, only for the haunted mansion. A true Disney legend. <laughs>